So we're delighted today to welcome again uh, to the webinar series, Dr. Mark Greenewald, who's Professor and Vice Chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the Carilion Clinic and the Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine. Dr. Greenewald will be presenting today, Seeking Feedback Like You Mean It, Time to Take I Act Shun. Uh, welcome, Mark. It's a pleasure to have you join us again. I'm going to pass our virtual microphone over to you to start the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Rohak. It's a pleasure to be here once again. And thank you for those of you who've carved out some time today to spend some time together talking about something uh, that I think is really vitally important. And perhaps now at the, at the end of our COVID winter, um, more than ever, the fact is that uh, we've, been, we've been in a survival mode for the past year. We may not have called it that, but I think we all know that we have been both professionally and personally. And, and during that time, we likely haven't been particularly hungry for growth. That's usually not what happens in survival mode, that we're really looking to just get through the day. And that's very understandable given the journey that we've all just taken. But now that COVID winter is over and we're entering spring, both literally, literally and figuratively, it's a wonderful time for any of those, those of us in healthcare and healthcare leadership and healthcare administrative leadership to step back and really begin to consider what does it look like post COVID? What will I look like post COVID? What will my work be like? What will my effectiveness be like? And today what I hope to do is to both demystify a little bit the whole idea of feedback, which has taken on all kinds of, of connotations for people people, and then to, to, to give you all a tool that we're going to work through together that if you started using regularly, regardless of where you are in terms of your comfort with feedback and the amount of feedback that you're receiving, I, I will promise you that this tool will help elevate the quality of the feedback that you're receiving. So when we think about feedback, you know, the, the first question that comes up is feedback, and, and perhaps even without a, a, a question mark, that should be an exclamation point. Feedback, um, because many people, and this just happened to me literally an hour before this call, one of my colleagues emailed me and said, uh, you know, feedback is, every time I hear the word feedback, I just get a yucky feeling inside, is his exact words. And I think that may be the case for many of us. So I ask you all to pause for a moment and just think about what emotion comes up for you, if any, when you hear the word feedback. Because it is very, it is very charged for many people. And we'll talk about the reason that it's charged for many people. And again, part of the tool is to help you navigate around that. Now, the other thing that I, I hope to do in doing that is to really provide you a chance to refresh whatever it is that you think right now about feedback and reconsider it in a new way. What I've seen happening lately is that feedback has fallen out of vogue as a word. And so what we've been doing instead is substituting other words for that. And the fact is, at the end of the day, it's the same idea, which is that we're trying to get information. And we're going to talk about that. How do we get that information? So here's the question just to start off. And you can, you can again, calibrate this in your own mind. If there was information about you, which would make you a better physician, leader, teacher, colleague, teammate, friend, husband, wife, mother, father, daughter, son. Would you want that information? Now, for many of you, you might think, well, duh, of course I would want that information. Uh, and yet, what I, will, what I will say is that that information is around us all the time. And we're gonna revisit that question again. I just have a confession to make at the beginning that I have a few feedback temptations when it comes to particularly seeking feedback from others. And I suspect that maybe some of you might have these too. My first, my first temptation is a clinical temptation and that's the temptation to not talk about feedback and to, to not open my mouth to ask others for feedback because in my professional role, often I have the ability and the power to do that. In my administrative role, a lot of times I don't wanna hear it. And so, so the temptation is just to say, I'm not going to reach out because frankly, whatever's coming my way, I just don't wanna deal with it right now. And then in my personal life, I'm often blind to it. And so the things that go on around me and likely the things that go on around for you as well are things that other people are quite aware of, 
that we're not always as aware of, or if we are, that we prefer to pretend that we're not. One of the things about feedback that's so important for us to understand is that um, feedback is about perspective. And so it's important for us to realize that the information that's coming to us in feedback is not necessarily true or factual or anything else. It's an opinion and it's a perspective of somebody else. Now, again, as we'll talk about, those perspectives can be quite valuable for people, um, but we still have to recognize that it's a, it's a perspective. And so if you just take this figure here and you just cock your head to 45 degrees to the right or to the left, you'll likely see two different things. Uh, you'll likely see a, a duck and you'll likely see a bunny. Both of them from that perspective are absolutely true. And, and, and as leaders, part of our responsibility is to say, how do I make sure that I'm understanding as many perspectives as, pos as possible, particularly for those people who are impacted by my leadership? Management guru Ken Blanchard says that feedback is the breakfast, lunch, and dinner of champions. And that may be true, and yet some of you uh, may have heard that uh, Krispy Kreme donuts are giving out free donuts for those people who get their COVID vaccine. So not all breakfast, lunch, and dinner is good for us. Uh, and so the question is, what kind of feedback are you feeding yourself uh, in terms of your own professional growth? So what are we talking about, feedback? So these are two definitions coming out of dictionary.com. And the most important thing I wanna emphasize for you is that feedback is about information. It's information about something. And it's used, as you can see in the first, in the first uh, definition, as a basis for improvement. It's a way to get better. And then the second definition is, is about something that we in, in the medical field are, are very familiar with, which is that feedback also has to do with system processes, biological processes, chemical processes, behavioral processes, all things that, that again, happen naturally and yet, for whatever reason, when it comes to, to human nature, we have this, this aversion to it. So here's my, feed, my, my definition is actionable information intended to stimulate a response. And that response is improved performance. So actionable information intended to stimulate a response. That's the definition that we're going to be going with today as we think about feedback together. So... Feedback is actually rocket science. Um, rocket science in systems theory says that you have a rocket that's traveling in a direction and there's a feedback loop. There's information in, in the system going back saying either the rocket is on target. And when that happens, the system provides positive feedback, which says continue on that course. If the rocket for whatever reason is deviating from that, then there's feedback that comes back that in, in systems uh, control theory is, is called negative feedback. And that feedback says, we need to make an adjustment because we're off course. And that's a wonderful way to think about what it is that's actually happening with feedback. We'll talk a little bit about those qualifiers, positive and negative in just a little bit, because often those are, those are terms that, that distract us from the power that feedback can have for us. Feedback is also complexity science. And again, in biological systems, there's lots of these, these systems controls happening in the network and that becomes more complex. And that's often what we see when we talk about feedback within the context of, of communities, within the context of organizations, within the context of departments, uh, and often within the context of two people. And then you get to the behavioral science of feedback and all of a sudden we lose the science part of it. And as humans, we respond often or react often by wanting to just bury our heads in the sand and pretend like it doesn't exist. And that's where we're going to start from today. So what I'd ask you to do is this. Just take a moment and rate yourself in terms of your desire to seek and receive feedback from others. Just rate yourself from very unmotivated to neutral to very motivated. Now, the fact that you're on this webinar right now would say that you are likely one who's going to rate yourself at least a six. Again, if you rate less than that, that's fine. But most of us would say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly motivated. I, feedback is important. And then I would ask yourself to say, if I were to come into your world right now, let's say as a coach, and to say, show me evidence of your desire to seek and receive feedback. How would you be able to show me that? Would you be able to look at your calendar and say, here's somebody who I've scheduled an appointment with specifically to give me feedback? 
here's what happens in terms of my day where I go out of my way to make sure that I deliberately and explicitly receive feedback. Because often what I see is people have desire to, to, to receive feedback, particularly leaders, but it goes something like this. I have an open door policy. If you have any feedback for me, my door is open or make an appointment, uh, but I, I really value your feedback. So please come and bring it to me. And when I, if I was doing this workshop live, I would ask you, so what happens? Do people line up at your door to come and give feedback? Or is there a line at the door if that's your boss who's saying that right now? And the answer is no, of course not. And I say, why is that? And they say, because it's intimidating to go give someone else feedback. And I say, what do you think the person who is the open door policy assumes by the fact that nobody is coming and giving them feedback? And they assume that everything is okay. But we know that it's really not. Often it's not at all the case. So we have a gap between the reality of what's really going on for those impacted by someone's leadership and the perception of what they think is going on. And often that's because they're living in a feedback vacuum. Here's the other thing that we know is that many of us avoid feedback because of those charges, those qualifiers that we've placed on it, those qualifiers of positive and negative or constructive. And so if you think about negative, what we consider negative feedback, negative feedback are those arrows that come our way, those that feedback that comes our way that just doesn't quite hit the center, doesn't quite hit the mark. And so in doing that, there's a lot of emotion invested for us. And often the reason that we don't seek feedback is because we know that giving feedback is so challenging when we're asked to give it as the messenger. So equally, we're hesitant to give it. People are hesitant to give it to us when we ask for the same reason, because as the messenger, they don't want to metaphorically be killed. And yet, without that, we can never know if we're really on target with the impact that we want to have. So part of this tool that I'm going to introduce you is the idea of how do we then make that better? So the second part of this, please rate yourself once again. In this case, my ability to seek and receive feedback from others. So not my, my desire now, but my ability to seek and receive feedback from very uncomfortable and underdeveloped skills to very comfortable and very strong skills. So again, just think about for yourself where you would rate yourself on that particular continuum. And again, likely based on this group, most of us would say, well, I'm at least a five. Um, and we'll talk in just a moment about why that's the case for many of us, because that's a natural phenomenon. Um, and so again, I would say, all right, what would that look like for you in terms of actively going out and seeking feedback? Because if there's not evidence of that, then there's likely a little bit of discomfort in terms of your ability to actually do that. So thinking about you all, I know because you're on this webinar, you are already successful. It's by definition. So how do we help successful people get better? Because often when we think about feedback, part of our challenge is that we think about feedback as telling us what we're doing wrong. That's not the case at all. Again, if you think back to the rocket science, the whole idea is I wanna make sure I'm on target, on target to whatever it is either that I have set as a goal or that we together have mutually agreed upon as a goal. And if I'm off target, I need a way to know how to get back on target again. That's what feedback is really about. So thinking about rating yourself relative to your professional peers in terms of your professional skills, what percentile would you rate yourself? Again, by whatever means, by whatever, by whatever criteria you would use, how would you rate yourself in your professional peers? So again, most of us would say at least the top half. Again, if we were all together, I'd be having you raise your hands to say, how many of you would say you're in a top half? And, and, and again, most of us would raise our hand readily for that one, top 25%. And here's what we know from the data. The data says that there is a phenomenon called the Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect goes back a long way. So many of you are likely already familiar with it. What the Dunning-Kruger effect basically says is that there is a tendency that we have in terms of our skills to overestimate them if our skills are not strong and sometimes actually underestimate them if our skills are stronger. And again, we know that in any group, if you look along a continuum or bell-shaped curve, there are going to be those in the, the lower quartile and those in the upper quartile. 
And so how do we recon reconcile the this effect of saying that most people kind of go to to the mean, that whole that whole idea of, of, of getting to the mean, or what's called the Lake Wobegon effect. Um, and again, depending on depending on where you are generationally, you may remember the radio show, the, the news from Lake Wobegon um, and, and Garrison Keeler. And so this whole idea that all the children are above average is part of this effect and part of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Here's what happens for professionals. Uh, Marshall Goldman, uh, who's a professional coach, did some work looking at this very same effect with professionals in general, and he found that 85% of professionals rate themselves in the top 20th percentile in terms of their professional abilities compared with their peers. When we look at physicians, that becomes even, even a less steep curve that 90% of physicians rate themselves in the top 10% in terms of their professional abilities as related to their colleagues. So stop and think about that for a second and think about the desire to seek feedback. Because truly, if I already consider myself in the top 10%, while feedback may be helpful for me, I think I'm probably doing pretty well. So feedback becomes more of a suggestion or perhaps a bonus than it is a necessity. So part of this tool is to help break us from that and to consider how we can get past that, both with physicians and also other professionals who we work with every day. And we're going to do that by taking a look in the mirror, which is really what feedback is all about, is allowing other people to become the mirror for us. So Dr. Rohek, I'm going to take a pause here for just a second and see if there are any questions in the chat from folks who are on the, on the webinar um, so we can clarify anything before we introduce the tool that I want to work through together in terms of how we can get past some of these barriers for feedback. Okay, uh, if people have any questions, please put them in the chat um, so we can read them out. So there are no questions right now. Uh, actually, we have one, you know, Mark, when you presented your slide about being blind, deaf, and dumb, uh -huh. um, the question is, it, it, there's an assumption that your feedback is always based on a deficiency to get better. Mm. What about encouragement of an abundance, getting feedback on the things that you do right? Absolutely, thank you for that question. And, uh, and whoever wrote that, you're foreshadowing exactly what we're going to be doing with this tool. Because feedback, feedback is not about deficiency, feedback is about gap. And so the idea being exactly that, how can you help people who are already quite good? Because again, even for healthcare professionals, let's use them as an example. We know that at some point in their life, every one of them was in the top 10th percentile. If that wasn't the case, they wouldn't be where they are right now. So it's not critical to say that, that, that by having them consider themselves that way, um, they're being arrogant or they're, 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 they're being naive. That's not the case at all. That's just statistics that we know that some are going to fall out better than others. The fact that most of them are very proficient at what they do, and yet there's always the opportunity to get better. And so that's exactly what we're going to explore together. And part of that process is this tool to be able to say, as leaders, it's our responsibility for the quality of feedback that we're receiving. So often, that, often I hear this from our own residents, part of, part of my job is to train uh, family medicine residents. And a lot of times we'll hear from residents, uh, they'll say either I get no feedback at all. And that's because often we're not explicit about saying, this is feedback that I'm about to give you right now. But even if we do, there's often a gap because they say the feedback that I'm getting isn't really helpful for me. And I always ask them, if that's the case, who owns that? And again, we as the receivers have to own that. And we're going to, I'm going to introduce you to this dialogue so that we can help really get through a lot of the challenge of what's happening in this sometimes very difficult conversation to, to get to the good stuff, to mine for the gold. So here's the question again. If another person had information about me, which may, would make me better in whatever capacity I wanted, um, would I want that information? And again, the answer is, of course, we would. Um, but sometimes 
sometimes we think about it more this way. And this is sometimes the barrier. If another person had information about me, which would likely make me uncomfortable, stretch me, maybe bruise my ego, but ultimately make me a better physician, leader, teacher, colleague, teammate, or friend, why do I want that information? Um, and the answer is, of course, it's the same information. And it's about the filter in which we're taking it through that's going to determine it. So what I wanted to do is introduce you to the IACT tool. And the IACT tool is something I've been using for over a decade now in my work. And, and I find that it's very powerful. And I also find very fascinating that many people don't even give this simple tool a try. And because of that, continue to live in feedback deficit in terms of their own development, their own professional development. So here's what we know. What we know is that in terms of behavior change, we know when something is important enough to us, when we have the will, and when something is, we were confident enough about something, we have the skill, then when we're ready and when we're willing and able, that's when we're ready. And so what we just went through is the whole idea of, of, of how do we begin to assess readiness? Um, how do we assess readiness in ourselves? We're used to doing that with others, but how do we then do that with ourselves? Well, once it comes to feedback, part of that readiness is to plan. And so the acronym that I've created is called I plan, and then I act. And then there's a third part before the three R's, and we'll talk about each of those. But the core of this is the I act, or what I call the I action piece. I'm going to break it down for you and then I'm going to give you some examples and I'm hoping at the end we can have some dialogue around exactly how this might look for you in your own work. So the first thing I do is I plan and this is perhaps the most overlooked part of feedback because what often happens with feedback is I may go up to somebody and say let's say let's say at the end of this talk I come up to somebody to one of the participants and I say hey do you have any feedback for me about my talk? The most common response that they're going to have is, I thought it was, I thought it was okay. I thought it was, I thought it maybe it went well. Um, and, and again, we'll come back to those answers because that's part of this process. But I plan says that there's certain people who are going to be able to give me better information than others. And I need to make sure that I'm mining those people who would have the best information to be able to help me in terms of my improvement, in terms of my growth, in terms of my betterness. And so I plan says, who do I want to get feedback from? And then it's the who, what, why, when, where, and how. Why am I seeking feedback from them? Is there a specific question that I have that they're uniquely qualified to answer? When do I want to receive that feedback? Timing is really important. And often it's best to actually schedule something or prepare them ahead of time. Where becomes important as well. The drive-by feedback in the hallway is usually not the most effective. And then the how part is exactly what I wanna show you now. So I plan and then I act. And in doing that, what I'm inviting them to do is to be a mirror for me in terms of perhaps some things that I'm not as aware of as I need to be, or perhaps I am aware of, and they're able to reinforce those for me. Many of you are probably familiar with the Joe Hari window. The Joe Hari window is basically a four box model that, that, that in many ways lays out a roadmap for what's happening in a lot of human relationships. What we know is that there are things that are known to me and known to others, or what's known as the area of free activity. This whole idea that you could say, right now I'm wearing a cream colored shirt. That's known to you and known to me. So we can talk about that. If we're both standing together looking out and it's raining, it's an area that we both know about. We can talk about that. Then there's some areas that are known to others, but not known to me. Those are the blind areas, as we like to call them. Those are our blind spots. I had a blind spot happen to me just the other day um, in my clinic. I was wearing a mask and apparently some of my green smoothie from that morning had gotten on my mask. And so as I'm walking around, there was a great big green splotch right there in the middle of my mask. Well, the amazing thing is even though we've created what I want to consider is a pretty safe space to, to give feedback to each other, it wasn't until my third patient for the morning that somebody actually said something to me. So I was totally blind to that and it was obvious to others. And so how do we expand our blind area? And then there's this area that's not known to others, but is known to us. 
um, sometimes what we call the hidden or avoided area. We all have those things that perhaps we feel shame about or perhaps we feel very vulnerable about. And so we like to often keep those hidden. And then there's areas that aren't known to us and not known to others. And I call, those, I call that the area of unknown activity. Um, and sometimes those things bubble up at certain periods of time. So with the Johari window then, what do we do with that idea of expanding? So how do I expand so I can plan and then act? Well, the first step is I have to invite. I have to go out and invite. So that passive model of the open door policy really for most people doesn't work. I need to go out and act, take an active role to seek the feedback that I need. And here's what I need to do then in doing that, I'm expanding that blind area. So I'm inviting others into this. And in doing that by asking, knowing that there's some things that I'm likely gonna hear about that are not familiar to me. And this will happen particularly if you have people in your life, in your orbit, that you've never really asked feedback from before, that sometimes they'll share things with you that you think, wow, you've been carrying that around quite a long time. Um, and that's, that's because again, the challenge of giving feedback is often so great. Here's what happens often because there's emotion involved with feedback. Feedback should be at its best, very personal because it should be very unique to you. And so here's what happens with feedback in your brain. Feedback comes along, your amygdala gets fired up and then something happens that's the equivalent in you of an explosion, whether that's your fight reaction, your freeze reaction, your flee reaction, or in some of us, we just kind of internally or sometimes externally freak out. And so how can we tame that? Because if that happens, you have now shut that person down and the feedback that you're going to get is gonna be very minimal and they're not coming back again. So how can we prevent that from happening? How can we create a pause in that? And again, that happens with the next step. So I've invited feedback and I'll show you in a moment how that might look. And then what I do is I attend, I listen, and I resist the one temptation I have as soon as they say something that I disagree with or I think they have the wrong perspective about, which is I just close my mouth, open my ears, and listen. And when I finally do open my mouth for the C, it's only for one reason. It's to clarify. And the words that I like to use are words such as help me understand this a little bit better. And I have to be very careful with my tone about that because I could easily, just as easily say, help me understand. And all of a sudden the same words take on a very threatening context. And again, as soon as I do that, I'm gonna chase that person away and shut them down. So I invite it, I listen. And again, this doesn't have to take long. This is not an hour long conversation often. I clarify. And then the final thing I do is I thank. I say, thank you. And I thank them for two reasons. I thank them, first of all, because it takes great courage, I believe, to give any kind of feedback to someone. And secondly, I thank them because often they're very incredible gems that they have just given me. And now it's my, my responsibility to go and do something about that. And there's a second piece of this. And this gets back to the question that was asked before about what I call the power of plus delta. So plus delta, many of you are likely familiar with as well. But plus delta is a structure for giving feedback that can help both create some boundaries around it and also allow me to commit myself in asking for feedback so that the other person can feel safer in terms of giving it. And so rather than saying, do you have any feedback for me, which is often the most common phrase that I see people use, or what feedback do you have for me? Plus delta says, what did you see about this particular aspect, this particular, whatever it is I'm seeking feedback about, that you thought was on target with my stated goal. So what I've done is I've given them a stated goal or I've given them an intention and they can give me what they think was on target from, from their perspective around that. And then Delta basically says, what are some things that you think maybe weren't on target about that? Maybe things that if you were me, you would have done differently. And this plus delta has incredible power to it. And again, I'll share with you in a moment how that plays out. So let's give it a try. So let's say for a moment, um, I see that, that, that um, Wayne Sotil is here. Wayne is a, is a good buddy of mine, goes way back, an incredible healthcare professional as a psychologist and coach. And 
let's say after this talk, because this will likely happen now that I see Wayne is here, I say to Wayne, Wayne, I'd love some feedback about my talk. Now, I have now invited Wayne into that feedback. Now, likely Wayne, because he's he has been schooled in this, will say to me, well, Mark, tell me what it is that you're looking for feedback about. And so I could ask him some various things. So let's just say I ask him, Wayne, I've been trying some different things with my slides, and I'd like to know what you thought about those slides. So now I've invited him into a more specific place. And now I listen. Whatever he says to me, he may say, well, Mark, some of your slides, the flow didn't seem quite right. Whatever that might look like, what I do then is I clarify, okay, do you remember which slide that was? Do you remember what, what it was about that slide that particularly stood out for you? And then finally, I thank him. Thank you, Wayne, I really appreciate this. And then what I do is I have three responsibilities. Call them three R's. First responsibility is just to reflect. Okay, so let's say that, that Wayne said to me, yeah, you know, there were some of the slides that just didn't seem to work very well. So I need to reflect on that. I need to say, well, what was it about those slides? I need to go back and look at them again. The second thing I need to do is respond. And this is a key component of this if you're thinking about using this tool, and I hope that you are. Respond is in two parts. The first response is that I go back and thank Wayne again. I say, Wayne, I've been thinking about what you shared with me, and I just wanted to say I really appreciated it. I, I, I believe it takes great courage in order to give somebody feedback. And so, um, and what I found was very valuable. And the other way I can respond then is by actually taking whatever it was that was helpful for me in that feedback and incorporating it then into my action into the future. So now I'm looking into the future. And then what I do is repeat. I begin to repeat that cycle again, and I'm going to show you how that works. So this is the second part of that then. So now I have information. Wayne has given me information that said, Mark, here's some slides that I want you to improve. So now as I go into my next talk, I now know that there's some changes that I've made to those slides, but likely he's not going to attend that next talk. And so now if I want to get feedback from someone else, I need to disclose that information if I wanna keep on that, that path of growth within that particular area. And so what I may say to somebody before that talk, I may notice I see Susan King is here. So I may say, Susan, I see that you're here for this talk. I've been working on some slides and I'm wondering if you would pay particular attention to my slides. I, I, I want you to pay attention to the talk, but I'd really appreciate if you would pay attention to the slides and just let me know how they worked for you. Again, I'm acknowledging to her, it's her perspective, um, and I'm hopefully doing it in a very non-threatening way, just inviting her into that conversation. So what will happen then, as I tell her that, is I will go back then and I will, I will be asking her, and now we have again a safe place. But here's the second piece of this that, that I've been utilizing that's even more powerful. So let's say that Susan is very schooled in this and she says, she, I go to Susan and I say, Susan, I'd love to hear some feedback. And she says, Mark, before I give you my feedback, I'd like for you to give yourself some feedback. What did you think were your plus delta with this particular talk? What did you feel like was on target from your perspective with your goals? And what do you think deviated from that? And then after I shared that with her, she would be able to have some additional context to share her plus delta back with me. I call that the bi-directional plus delta. And it's incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful. So how would this look then? Once again, let's give it a try. So S Susan would say, you know, Mark, um, here's, so I would say, here's, here's some things I've been working on in my talks. And I made some changes in some of my slides in terms of the flow. And I may give some details about some particular slides. Once again, she may say, Mark, before I do that, tell me a little bit about what you thought went well. I'd say, well, I tried some new things with some new visuals. Um, they seem to flow well. They seem to make sense. My delta was that, that in some ways, I, I continue to find it a little bit challenging to do virtual webinars, and I love to see people's faces. And so I wonder often in the middle of my talks how that's actually playing out for people. And she can say, here's what I thought went really well or was on target. It doesn't have to be very well what was on target. Here's some things that... I may have done differently, or here's some things that I think you may have considered doing differently that may have had even more of an impact. So again, that gets back to, it doesn't say it was bad. It just says that may have had even more of an impact if you had done it this way. 
Now, over time, my invitation to you is that you form a feedback network. I believe feedback can be valuable from anybody, but I truly believe it can be most valuable from people who see us regularly in terms of our work or in terms of our home life or whatever it is that we are seeking feedback about, but also people who we trust and respect. So people we have a relationship with who we know they will be open with us, uh, that they won't just be putting on platitudes or niceties, but they'll give us what it is that we need to continue to grow. Now, the power question that I, I think is helpful as well is if you were me, what would you do differently? Which is a, a nice way to disarm again the question around feedback. Now, feedback for me also is helpful. I shared earlier that feedback is most helpful if you have some rituals around it, if you have built it into your professional life. So here's some feedback rituals that I have that I've been doing this week that I do every week to prepare me and to get me in the right place to make sure that I'm incorporating feedback regularly into the work that I do. First of all, in my, in my clinical world, part of the way I, I have incorporated feedback into that is I specifically ask. And so every time I'm in clinic, I will specifically ask my nurse, she knows this now, and, and she knows that I'll be asking what went well, what didn't go so well, and this, this is a daily ritual for us when we're in clinic together. In terms of my administrative role, I meet with my own, my own supervisor, which is my chair, every week. We have a one-on-one -on -one session every week. And the first agenda item on our session every week is a plus delta. And we do a bi-directional plus delta for each other. So we both do this. And we've been doing this now for over two years. Incredibly powerful because before we did this, sometimes because in this particular case, I report to him, I was holding back on things that I wouldn't have otherwise just because of that reporting role. And so it has disarmed it completely. It is just part of what we do. And then at home, part of my ritual, and this, this is a longer story, but part of my ritual is that every day I wipe down the sink after I shave. Because a long time ago, my wife and I, when we were about seven years into marriage, um, had, a, had a circumstance where we were inviting each other to give feedback. And she gave me feedback that when I shaved, I left a lot of water on the sink. And often she would lean against it and get wet and not think very wonderful thoughts about me first thing in the morning. And it took a long time for her to actually share that with me. And yet it was such an easy thing to correct. So every day I wipe down that sink and think about the power of seeking feedback from somebody and how it can truly change our lives. So I wanna pause there and just allow the rest of our time together to be one of dialogue. And so Jim, if you could, uh, if you could go ahead and open up the chat and see what folks have uh, on their minds. And again, any question that could have to do with this or not, I'm glad to have dialogue around it. Okay, so uh, here's a question about uh, the process for feedback, one of the mechanisms in large groups is to create town halls mm -hmm. where people can discuss concerns without necessarily naming names. Have you utilized that in this uh, process for feedback? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for that question. And you, you can really use the same type of process. Us. And again, the first step is to be able to disarm. So let me give you an example. Let's just say you're having a town hall right now around COVID uh, and around COVID processes, which I think for many, many organizations, that would probably be a good town hall to have. One of the things that I would do were I, the one who was facilitating or leading this town hall, would be to start out by perhaps acknowledging both some things that I thought went, had been going well, but also acknowledging things that we could have done better. The reason that I would do that and the reason I think it's important is because that disarms the group and they in many ways begin to know what are the boundaries around what we're safe talking about. So I'm trying to create psychological safety for that group. So the same thing will happen. I will invite it. And again, by having a town hall, I think that's implied, but that's like saying I have an open door policy. So I wanna be as specific as possible. And sometimes I'll even provide leading questions Say, mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about how we've done around keeping our staff safe. And here's some things I think we've done well. Here's some things I don't think we've done well. What is your perspective on that? And then the same thing, I've invited, now I listen, I attend. And I just take that in. 
and I ask clarifying questions. And one of the things, again, in a town hall is that sometimes, depending on the circumstances, emotions can get pretty high. And it's my job to continue to step back, press my, my, my metaphorical pause button, and to be able to just make sure that when I'm clarifying, I'm literally clarifying for the sake of understanding better what it is that their concern is, and then thanking them. And part of that is to be able to say, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly what we need to do about that now. Let me make sure to get back to you. And then closing that loop again becomes very important. But absolutely, I think the same idea holds. And what I see often happens in town halls is that most people don't feel that psychological safety. And so the, the questions are often very superficial um, or it becomes a little bit more of a pep rally. I have nothing against pep rallies, um, but that's not what the purpose is if you're really seeking out information. Right. Are there other uh, techniques uh, to be able to turn off your amygdala so you don't uh, immediately uh, have that emotional response when, when you're challenged as a leader? Yeah, and thank you. The, the first one is, is know what those hot buttons are for you. We all have them um, and they're not the same. And so things that may set me off are very different than things that may set off my wife for instance. And so knowing what those are so that you have then practiced ahead of time. Um, and that's part of, part of the ability of the pause button is in that moment to be able to reframe, to be able to distract yourself. If your mind is going to a place where you know, uh-oh, reaction is coming, to take a deep breath. Um, sometimes to, to literally be able to say, I just need to step out for a moment. Um, I'm distracted right now. Again, you don't have to say I'm really angry right now. Just say, I'm sorry, I'm distracted right now. Um, let me step out for a moment and, and I want to pick up where we've left off. So whatever it is that you need to do to make sure you don't derail the conversation becomes very important, but it starts before you ever enter the conversation. And part of that is the plan. So I plan, then I act for a reason because I want to make sure that I don't get caught off guard. Even having said that, sometimes we do. There Again, the drive-by feedback that often happens, and sometimes that happens because people don't feel safe. Um, and so they'll, they'll just give us some feedback and then run away. Um, and the ability to once again be the again, I like to say, and this is this is feedback for me. I, I want to make sure that I'm being the, a grown up in the room, not necessarily the grown up in the room, but a grown up in the room, and being able to say this is feedback, um, and to be able to say, look, even though this is personal, it's not threatening me. Um, there's nothing about what they're saying that is threatening my personhood. It's threatening my ego, and so my ability to acknowledge that and say, okay, ego. It's time to get over this a little bit. And remembering that just because they're saying it doesn't mean it's true. It just means it's true for them. And it's my responsibility to know what to do with it. So I've had people give me feedback that was not done in a very, in my, in my view, a very effective way. Perhaps they gave me feedback out of anger. Perhaps they gave me feedback because they were trying to, in many ways, um, trying to establish power position. And so their feedback was often, again, not well-intended. My job is still the same, certainly as a leader in my leadership role. Now, again, if somebody's out of line, I can still provide them feedback as well. But in the context of me asking, I have to make sure that I keep that space safe because what will happen is if I don't, and what I find is that most feedback people give in the first round, let's say you go to ask somebody for feedback, it's a very rare person that will give you their really good stuff the first time around. I have to establish trust first. And the way I establish trust is how I receive that feedback the first time and how I respond to it for them. So yeah, there's, a, there's some humble pie that needs to be eaten in this process, but I can promise you on the other side of that, particularly with your feedback network, um, it can be, give you some powerful things in terms of the information that comes to you, often that wouldn't have come any other way. So uh, your colleague Wayne has uh, teed up the question, um, how about your thoughts on dealing with a receiver's delayed embarrassment? in reaction to the feedback session. So you- so, so I'm sorry, phrase that again. So you've, um, you've pr provided some uh, feedback and the receiver, however, has had a delayed embarrassment ah, okay. uh, in reaction to the session. How, how do you, uh, how, some thoughts on how to deal with that? So they've given me feedback, but some, for some reason they, that's caught cause them some embarrassment. I just want to yes. make sure I understand that correctly. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, that's about disarming um, and, and being able to go back. If I notice that, then without embarrassing them even more um, to be able to first in the moment, just to say, to, to say, you know, to acknowledge that this is challenging sometimes. And I really do appreciate it. This matters greatly to me um, that 
you're willing to do that. I'll, I will use the word courageous often um, because I do believe that 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 is true. Um, and and you know, and, and, and when, as much as possible, I want to make sure then that I go back and respond to them and really again thank them again. Again, and to tell them I've really been processing it because a lot of people when they give that feedback are also insecure. Sometimes they give feedback and, and they, they, they believe it to be true, um, but they're insecure about it because again, we all as professionals can project competency incredibly well. Uh, and so my ability to then go back, reflect first, so not react, reflect, and then respond thoughtfully. And sometimes that's very deliberately. I will, I will schedule another time with them or I'll make sure that we're in the same place at the same time. And I will initiate the conversation to again, demonstrate to them that I wanna disarm that process and to create that psychological safety as much as possible. Now that's so, different. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jim. Well, I think uh, Wayne clarified. So, so again, the receiver, in mm -hmm. other words, you've provided the feedback. They are now embarrassed by the yeah. vulnerability that your feedback was created. Yeah, so, great, great question. You know, and and so so this is I've specifically focused on on seeking and receiving rather than giving. And thank you, Wayne. I can make that more explicit. Um, having said that, the same processes that we're talking about can often translate very well then to giving feedback as well. Starting with the fact that if I'm giving feedback to somebody for the first time. I, again, unless we've created a lot of psychological safety, I'm not going to the deep end of the pool right away. I may feel very comfortable with that, but I got to know that they are going to be able to be comfortable with that. So a few things that I do ahead of time as the giver, one thing is I plan as well. So I think about who is this that I'm giving feedback to? Um, many times I will ask them explicitly, how is it that you best like to receive feedback? So again, I don't ask them, do you want to receive feedback? I can't do that in many of my roles. It's my responsibility to give them feedback. But I ask them, how do you, do you, do you have a style that you like? And some people do, some people don't. And I give them suggestions that some people would prefer that I write some things down and give it to them in advance. Some people just want it straight up. Um, some people want it in, in, in bits and pieces. Um, we've all heard about that thing, the proverbial feedback sandwich. And, and I'm very cautious about the feedback sandwich. But if you think about the feedback, feedback sandwich, which is kind of telling somebody something positive, which again, I think is a wrong misnomer to label feedback as negative or positive in that way implies that I'm prejudging the feedback. Um, so I think feedback is feedback. Same thing with constructive. Constructive implies that I would give somebody destructive feedback on purpose. So in criticism, of course, is judgment. So that idea of constructive criticism to me is, is the language that, that I would be cautious about. So I, it's just about feedback for me and to be able to to say then, um, you know, what are some, here's some things that I saw that seem to be on target. And if I know what their goals are ahead of time, that's a disarmament as well. What is it that you've been working on? What did we agree that we're going to be working on together? And that provides that safe space rather than that open-ended, here's some feedback, and I may be way off the mark if I do that. So the more I can be on target with something with their learning edge, as I like to call it, the more effective that feedback is going to be, and the more receptive they're going to be to it. Now, having said that, there are some things I do want to point out no matter what that went well. Here's some things I noticed that really went well. And there's always something that went well. Um, and then here's some things I noticed once again that, that I think could have been done that would have been more effective for you. That's often the term that I will use. Not that went wrong, um, that, that could have been more effective. Usually the person who's receiving that feedback usually knows if something went very wrong. And I often, and then I will always give them the opportunity to give themselves feedback first as well. How do you think this went? And often, again, if, 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 if patterns repeat themselves, for professionals at least, we're often way harder on ourselves than the actual person giving feedback will be. Some people, that's not the case, but often that will be the case. Right. So another question uh, has been raised. Okay, uh, we're in an academic environment. Uh, what's a good way to initiate this change with all our faculty for each other, yeah. as well as to give more direct feedback with residents? Yeah, so the, it, it becomes a process. In our, in our own residency program, we call it creating a culture of feedback. So how do we create a culture where, where again, feedback's not a naughty word. Feedback is just expected because growth and betterment and improvement are the desire of everyone. And again, that, that's an assumption. And, and in professional circles, that's usually the case. For those who that's not the case for, that becomes a different, that becomes a different conversation in many ways. Um, but, but in terms of creating the culture, start with you. So wherever you are in that, in that hierarchy to be able to start 
um, with, again, a feedback network to be able to, if you're not in charge, to be able to go to your chair or whoever's in charge and to be able to say, you know, here's, here's some thoughts that I have. Again, we've included the handout with some things in the chat so you can have access to the material and just try it. Um, try some plus deltas with some people. Um, and, you know, don't necessarily make it formal right away. Though, as I said, the more you can create that into your formal process, um, we try to create this in our, in our meetings together. What's, what are we on target about as a group? What are we deviating from as a group? So it provides that conversation that we're always looking for ways to improve. Um, again, it may be something that you can add on to whatever culture you already have, but my experience is that most, again, most academic cultures, most cultures in general, don't really have a structured process right now. So this is one way to begin to create that process. Um, and, and, you know, within our residency program, and it, it, again, we, there may be some eye rolling from the group, but we have Feedback Friday. So every Friday, we make sure that everyone gets some very deliberate feedback and information about how things are going. And the, the reason we did that is because, as I shared previously, our residents claimed, even though we were often doing the very same things, that we never gave them any feedback. And so when the ACGME comes around and does their surveys, the residents would say, we don't get feedback. And, right. and so we had to start naming it and we've had to do the same thing with education. This is teaching that I'm about to do right now, um, but right. feedback, we do the same thing. I'm going to give you some feedback right now. And then we go through and use the IACT um, acronym in order to, to be able to, in this case, giving feedback looks a little bit differently, but we've trained them in the same way. So we hope that they're able to begin to use those same things in terms of their response. And often they don't get it, they don't get it right away and that's okay. Um, that's part of grace as we try to all grow together. Right. So one of the uh, slides that you showed was a hat about that seemed to have a feedback sort of logo on it. Do, you, yes. does, do all of your faculty have those in their pockets uh. that they then stick on their head when they're focused on the resident? So the resident really gets it that, oh, hey, we're, we're giving you feedback. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, that's yeah. A, that, that, that would be the ultimate announcement. I'm going to put on my feedback uniform that's right. now. I'm and, giving uh, and verbal, give you feedback. verbal cues. Verbal yeah, cues. Verbal well, cues, though, are good. And, 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 and again, so our residents know for me, so I talked about the pause button earlier. Um, I, I literally, this is my pause button. This is my ID badge. And, and often early on, particularly as I was, as I was becoming more self-aware in terms of my own tendencies and my own hot buttons, I would actually literally put my finger on that, sometimes during rounds in the hospital, um, because it was a reminder to me that I'm about to deviate and say something that I will regret. And I actually created a backup pause button as well, and it is this. And my backup pause button is a reminder, don't open your mouth right now. You're about to say something once again that will do no good. And so that uh, I had to have a backup because my first one uh, didn't often, it, it, at least early on, didn't often work. It malfunctioned too much. Well, uh, Mark, I think that's it for the questions. Um, so I want to remind everybody on the uh, uh, webinar that we have resources available for you and your staff uh, that are on the slide there. Again, everybody's going to get a copy of the slide uh, ahead of time. So please uh, visit. Uh, these are all available on the amaassn.org uh, website. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have another uh, presentation about what makes a high-performing practice. Uh, Kathleen Blake uh, within our PS2 unit uh, will be talking about that. And you can see in April 7th and April 20th, two other uh, presentations that will be upcoming. And then lastly, I uh, want to remind everybody, if you have any questions at all, please contact us at action.labs at amaassn.org. So uh, Mark, I wanna thank you so much for your uh, expertise, your practical uh, experience and some good tips on how to improve uh, the practice and improve the culture in, your or in our respective organizations. To those on the webinar, thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you again soon in another webinar and tomorrow's a good time. So. Again, uh, thanks everyone and have Thank uh, a great afternoon.